Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. This is the Fedora Podcast, and I'm your host, Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks. Welcome to episode number 38. Uh, we're, we're closing, or sorry, 37, 37. I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I actually had the show notes pulled up for 38, which we're recording in two weeks, and that episode will be live. So now with that false start, <laughs> today we're going to be talking about a very important conversation about the future, the sort of the current state and the future state of the Fedora project, Fedora Linux, all the spins. Uh, and I could think of no one better to join me in that conversation than the Fedora project lead, Mr. Matthew Miller himself. Matthew, welcome back to the Fedora podcast. Yeah, nice to talk to you again. Uh, it's been a little while. That thing with been. getting the numbers mixed up, I am doing that all the time. Like this is, you know, Fedora Linux 41 coming out now. So I've got 42 on my mind already. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to get ahead of things. So I just transitioned out of uh, being part of the REL business unit, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux team uh, as a technical marketer. And I, I fully understand what you're going through with, with releases because not only does Red Hat keep multiple versions of REL live and in the, in the, in the open at any given time. I mean, you've got REL 7 and ELS, REL 8, REL 9, uh, REL 10 beta is coming out. So I totally feel your pain uh, because you'd, kind of get lost on now what minor version are we on and what what release is this who am i <laughs> yeah we we put our we have well basically three rawhide the develop you know which is the development branch and then um, the current and the next or current and the one behind i mean and then for a about a month we have some overlap so that people can or you know you can you can skip a release if you want to be on a slower cadence and upgrade once a year so we provide that month of overlap for that but um, yeah um, the rel people maintaining that super old stuff like heroes really that's oh for sure <laughs> Yeah, so I don't, I don't know who would want to upgrade Fedora only once a year. I'm always uh, chomping at the bit, and sometimes even jumping on the beta program because I'm always excited about uh, new things coming out in Fedora. Yeah, there's, um, I think uh, people in schools often do it that way, so they have a new thing for, for the school year, that kind of um, thing, or just, uh, yeah, a lot of places where it's a managed deployment, they don't want to have all that churn twice a year, I guess. I mean, we try to down but it is it, it's some work every time so before we get in too deep into our topic we're, we're in case you missed it in my my complete flub of of an introduction today we're talking about the Fedora strategy uh and the importance of having a strategy in a in a community driven project like fedora uh, why don't you introduce yourself to we've, we've got a bunch of new listeners on the podcast so for those that don't know you uh why don't you give a, a brief introduction Sure. Uh, I am Matthew Miller. I am a distinguished engineer. I'm actually now a distinguished engineer and manager at Red Hat. Um, <laughs> and I have been the Fedora project leader for a little over a decade now. And um, I've been involved in Fedora before that. I feel like it's a huge privilege to get paid to work on Fedora. And I'm glad I have the opportunity. Yeah, I'm quite jealous. And if I'm not mistaken, you are now the undisputed uh, longest tenured uh, FPL. Oh, oh yes, record. but but I, I'm actually coming up on being having been the FPL longer than everyone else put together. Oh, so, wow. So um, that's that's kind of the real milestone. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So what what about on on the fun side of life? Uh, is there anything exciting that you're working on? Any home projects? Um. Of course, there's like a million things. I have a bunch of stuff that I'm doing. <laughs> um, the ESP32 microprocessors and CircuitPython, just little fun things around the house. I made a thing that <laughs> displays the time and weather in the bathroom on a big thing that I can see without my you know contacts in. Nice. Um, and I'm pretty happy about that. My it's a you know 64 by 32 pixel display, and it has you know the weather by hour across in a little graph. It's it's minimalist, but gives you a lot of information. Um, nice. So I'm, I'm happy with that. And I'm actually also doing some fairy lights for my daughter for her room with different colors. And we can, you know, instead of the kind you buy and you got to cycle through six things to get the, mm -hmm. this, we can get it just right. Uh, uh, thinking of having a Stranger Things mode on it where it you know, blinks messages. That kind of thing. <laughs> Well, my my oldest daughter has fairy lights in her bedroom, and they they are commercial. So you'll you'll have to let us know how that project turns out because I I would love to replace some of the commercial stuff in our house with open source projects. 
the first time I did it, I bought the, um, I thought I'm going to solder this together. I can do it. And I did, I'm, I hate hardware. Um, so, uh, you can, with <laughs> Adafruit is an awesome company. You can actually just, you know, for a dollar or something, you could buy a little, you know, clip that, you know, it just plugs right into. And I sure should have done that in the first. Uh, <laughs> lessons, lessons are learned. That's fair. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Hardware and I don't always get along. And as I get older, I get tremors in my hands and it's like, I don't want to deal with little tiny circuit boards anymore. So. Yeah. I mean, it's nice with the Adafruit, a lot of the Adafruit, I mean, this is not an Adafruit commercial, but I love their stuff. <laughs> a lot of it is just, you plug it all together and you don't have to worry about that. But if you are listening, I mean, the Fedora podcast would love to have a, a, a sponsor. I mean, <laughs> just, just saying. I take that one. They're cool. <laughs> so we're talking about Fedora strategy today, and um, we're we're not getting as technically deep into the weeds as as we usually do. But I think uh, as as podcast grows and as the community is is growing like crazy, uh, we're we're onboarding new developers and sort of in the wake of uh, Flock to Fedora just a few weeks ago at, at the time of recording. I think it's important to to take a step back and talk about where are we and where we are going. Um, I think that'll really help uh, as we dive in deeper in, in, the, in the bottom half of, of 2024 into where are we going. Um, so I think it's important to kind of start with Matthew. Where, where is the Fedora project today? What are, what are some of the concerns? Where, what, are, what are some of the current initiatives? Yeah, uh, so I think we're, we're in really good shape. I, um... I noticed Fedora being mentioned in blog posts as an aside all of the time in a way that I didn't used to. Like people are doing, you know, doing something, and then they mention they're doing it on Fedora, um, Fedora Linux. So I that makes me that makes me happy whenever I see those things. And kind of that organic use. You know, we 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 didn't you know see that messaging or anything. People are out there using it for real and showing it off. Mm. And that, you know, that's great and shows people are excited and using it for real things and that kind of you know, that stuff builds. Um, that's actually, so um, to the strategy, I think that kind of thing, we, we, growth is basically the goal. <laughs> uh, and when we're looking at what we want to do with the project and where we want to take it, one of the things we constantly feel like is we're under-resourced on things, and usually that's time. And so right now we have about two to 300 people who are do something every week in Fedora. Now it's the same 200, 300 people. The overall total in a year is in the thousands. Some people just mm. do a couple of buy things a year, or they've got one little thing that needs updating twice a year, and they do that, and that's their main thing. It's kind of a long tail of that. Um, but the basic idea is that metric of the number of user, a number of contributors doing something, and that can be you know writing docs, make, helping people on Ask Fedora. Um, you know, packaging obviously is a big you know, core thing. Doing QA, all of those things are our contributor activity. We have a very broad definition of a contributor, and uh, which I which I like. I think it makes the project accessible to a lot of people. Um, and yeah, so the goal is to double that number. So it's you know four or five hundred people who are mm. you know, six hundred people who are really active every. Week. Um, I think that's that that's aggressive, but I think we can do that. Uh, especially with that expensive, expansive definition and kind of that larger pool of people who are active will let us do a lot more. Like it's pretty hard to guess, you know, what is, what's computing going to be like in 2029? You know, is it all going to be AI or is it all going to be something <laughs> else that we haven't heard? Or is, you know, is it back to how it was? Who knows? Probably not back to how it was, but, um, <laughs> bringing, you know, just the health of the community and, you know, people hanging out and being around and working on things together uh, that that's what we really need no matter what the technology is uh, we do have a bunch of technical initiatives within the strategy one of the things about fedora although i am the project leader uh, there's no one i can tell what to do well that's actually not true now i have a person who reports to me but <laughs> let's go say you are a manager of reports but uh, Outside of that, and in in Fedora space, I you know the, it is a lead by influence and try to uh, get people kind of going in the same direction. And in order mm -hmm. to do that, I can't just like make up. Here's the thing we're going to do. Everybody do it because you know people are volunteering their time and they're going to do what they're interested in doing. Um, and so 
our strategy really came from conversations with people in the community about what they are interested in, what their priorities are, and what they want to get done. And I kind of looked at those and decided to focus on some that we really think are going to help the project grow as we go forward. Hmm. So if, if I can ask the hard question, yeah. um, you're talking about growth. And this this isn't... I don't know how much Fedora is affected by this, but as I look at the open source community itself, um, one of the major factors that I've seen around the industry, and in, in particular open source, is developer burnout. We, we've been seeing people, long-time people in major projects that uh, are either coming up on retirement age or they're just exhausted and they're stepping away from some of the projects that uh, some of them have even founded. Um, is is that impacting Fedora at all? Um, maybe some. Um, I, I have, well, I actually have a lot of uh, old time people like me still around. Um, but uh, and, and we are getting you know, another thing I really like. We are getting new enthusiast people who are you know showing up, and uh, some of them you know grew up with Fedora. Like it was uh, that's that's amazing to me. Um, you know, Fedora is older than both my children, so I guess I should be able to <laughs> But, um, yeah, one of the things we're focusing on in the strategy is mentorship, and that is specifically mm -hmm. to address that thing, um, to make sure that we bring new people in and transfer knowledge and that people get the support. So, um, and our, our tagline for that is, um, everyone is a mentor, everyone has a mentor. Uh, hmm. So it's not just a thing where it's just, you know, the old people imparting their wisdom down to the new the young people or whatever. It's, <laughs> you know, everybody is something they can share with somebody. Everybody knows something about that and they can help another person learn. And they can also, everybody has things they need to learn and or could, want to learn or could learn. Or, and there's room to go the other direction as well. So that I think is going to, you know, it helps burnout because you know, human connections are one of the key yes. things to helping burnout, uh, but also actually getting more support and, you know, having the, one of the really big things that I feel like leads to burnout is a feeling of, if I don't do this, no one will. And then right. you get guilt and overworking and then you tie yourself out and then, you know, trouble happens. So having that idea, okay, I know there's there's a legacy here. It's going to continue. <laughs> there's other people who are interested in these things and are carried on. I think that's a really important thing for that burnout aspect of it. And then it's also important on the other side, we need new contributors. We need growth. We need to get people into the project. And because it's such an expansive thing that's been around for 20 years, it's sometimes hard to, you know, um, get started. It's overwhelming. And even our right. like, dart guides are spread out all over. Um, <laughs> so uh, having people to connect to uh, really is a good good onboarding kind of thing. Mm. Uh, for, for a free PSA to our listeners, uh, why don't you pitch the uh, Fedora Social Hour? Oh, yeah. So this is something I do every week. It's sometimes very well attended, sometimes very sparsely, but there's a few dedicated people who are usually there. It is on Thursday, at, you know, and it is we have a late for me or early for some other people around the world with uh, time and then an, an early for me time on alternating Thursdays. If you go to discussion.fedoraproject.org and look in the announcements thing, there's a post that shows it has the latest times and updates there. We do that using Matrix, um, the open source chat protocol thing, and then using the video call there, which I believe is Jitsi powered underneath that. Yes. If we get, sometimes we get a lot of people, if we get more than about a dozen, we sometimes have to switch to something like Google Meet instead of Jitsi. <laughs> because, um, I don't necessarily have to for that, um, but uh, most of the time it works very smoothly. And that's just, uh, we, we, we had a, for a while during COVID a no talking about Fedora rule or no talking about, um, just so we made sure we were always talking about other things. And we sometimes, we often have, you know, wide digressions and you talk about public transit or food around the world or mm. uh, weird places in the world where borders are strange. Like there's a place <laughs> in Chile and Argentina, or if you look in Google Maps, they just stop drawing the line. And then it starts again a little later because they're like, yep, yeah, no, we're just staying out of this one. Um, 
I, I, stuff like that. Um, it, it, it's fun to hang out. And this is also one of the things um, Marie, who used to be in our role, we call the uh, Community Action and Impact Coordinator. It's kind of a community. Uh, Justin Flory is in that role now, and it's Community Architect, which I think is a more standard name. Uh, we, we picked the first one because we didn't want to call it Community Manager because that sends mm -hmm. all the wrong vibes. Um, so anyways, in, in that role, one of her you know, insights, I think, was that getting people involved, like the um, it's the normal thing in tech projects is like a good first issue. Like you find mm -hmm. some first thing to do and then you kind of get in through there. We found it's a lot better if we can get people into you know, coming to the social hour, um, coming to our release parties that we do, just hanging out in the social channels, chat channels, introducing themselves in the discussion forum. And then you kind of get to you get to know the people and the project. And then from there, it's really easy to find something where you want, you know, that fits into what you want to help with. And I think that's a really good way to get involved. I mean, obviously if not everybody is that way, if, if good first issue is the way you want to do it, we've got plenty of those too. But I think that we, we have a longer lasting you know, connections with again, human connections, bringing people into the project. Awesome. So I know one of the things that I've been hearing a lot about in the community over the past few weeks is the inevitable next release. We You mentioned Fedora 41 at the top of the episode. Uh, where where are we at with Fedora 41? Keeping yeah. in mind that this is the last full week of September as we record. Um, so what's what's going on with Fedora Linux 41? Yeah, I try to make sure I say Fedora Linux because Fedora is the project. I know it's it's a hard habit to change, and I will slip up on it as well. But Fedora Linux is the thing we produce. Fedora is us, just like you know, um, Red Hat is not Rel. Uh, but anyways, um, that's <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I hold myself to it as well. So Fedora Linux 41 beta is. Um, out there ready for you to test so you can go to get fedora and or get fedora.org or um, which will redirect you to the downloads place on the fedora project website and uh, you know download things test them out or if you have a system already installed you can use dnf to upgrade to the new version um, and to try it out then um, i don't want to jinx things but i think we're on a pretty smooth track to the next release <laughs> um it probably i'm jinxing it but I, I think we'll have a um you know um Late October release is you know, as per the schedule uh, it's, it should be on track. Um, there's a lot of interesting things. One of the big things that I'm honestly a little bit worried about, but we'll see how it goes. It seems to be going smoothly so far. Um, we're transiting the. This is kind of an enthusiast level thing. So um, if you are not a super nerdy Linux user, that's okay. You don't really need to care about this. But DNF is the command line package management tool, and that's being replaced. It's, it's, the current version is written in Python. It's being written with a new version that's written in C++, um, hmm. C, and is meant to be, you know, it is much faster. It uh, is a little bit smarter about what it downloads. So it's uh, faster and much more memory, um, much less memory hungry, I guess. I'm trying to think of memory conservative. <laughs> Small. It's smaller, um, and go. so it'll be uh, <laughs> better on small devices, Raspberry Pi kind of things, and faster, mm. you know, nicer everywhere. Um, I think DNF's uh, speed has been something people, well, you know, back when it was yum, people were like DNF. It's so much faster, and now they're they're going to say this new DNF is even faster than that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that it was previously you could install that as a preview as DNF five, and now mm. you don't have five anymore. Just DNF will bring you to that. Um, gotcha. See, um, trying to think of uh, what the one. So there's a thing that is I think useful for this is not actually a, a quite a Fedora level thing because we do not ship a binary proprietary NVIDIA driver. And mm -hmm. the way NVIDIA works, if you want to actually do acceleration, you basically need that. Now they're moving slowly towards getting better about this, at least in a pragmatic way, not necessarily in an open as in freedom way. And this mm -hmm. is how you know, Intel and AMD do this. They shove all of their secrets into a binary blob that doesn't run on the computer, but runs you know, on their device, a firmware. And we have long held that you know it's okay. We are shipping as long as they're redistributable. Fedora uh, will ship 
in Fedora Linux, the, these binary firmwares uh, that are needed to light up hardware. And I know that this is a reason we, you know, there are a few distributions that are you know, pure and do not do this. And I <laughs> think that's great, but they only run on a very select limited hardware. And we really want mm -hmm. our, our vision is for open source to be available to everyone and for everyone to be a part of it. And so we need to make, you know, we, we, we set the dial at a different place because you've got to light up the hardware. Uh, anyway, in, in, in Fedora's defense, I mean, it, it's long been my, my Linux distribution of choice and not because I work for Red Hat, but because I've been around Fedora since like Fedora core three, something like that. <laughs> um, but one of the things I like about the Fedora installer is as you're going through, it actually gives you the option to enable those repositories to pull down that, or not the repositories, right. but to enable yeah. that that software. And it <laughs> basically says, by the way, if you enable this, you're not like, to, to use your word, you're not pure, but it I don't know about you. Being judgy like that. We try to work <laughs> right. carefully. Right. Um, it's, it's very diplomatic, but, but the, the point I'm driving towards is just that it it allows you to make that decision at at install time, and for me that's really been helpful. As it's I actually shifted... first boot, not install time, but it's there. Um, fair, but fair. good. Um, yeah, so this is actually one of the things I was, I was getting getting to. Uh, previously, the NVIDIA driver did not work with secure boot at all, unless mm -hmm. you did a lot of manual things. Um, we have now some features to make it possible for you to use NVIDIA driver with secure boot. This is important because secure boot is on by default on a lot more hardware, and it's eventually going to be a kind of thing you just can't turn off. So we mm -hmm. want to make sure that stuff works there. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit of a compromise. I really wish they would go all the way to an open source driver, um, or at least like the pragmatic thing of having the kernel driver and everything on the you know, Fedora Linux software side be open source. And then I would love to see more completely open hardware, like we see in the RISC-V space some places, although even there, there's a lot of proprietary bits that would be better to be open. I would love everything to be open, but um, uh, small progress towards the better over time. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, and um, let's see. Uh, one of the things that's interesting from the point of view of us distribution builders and maybe language, computer language enthusiasts, uh, we're getting rid of Python 2 completely now, finally, which has been long coming. Python 2 hasn't been actually supported by the Python project for a long time. Right. Uh, there's a lot of old code that's dependent on it. We've got everything that's packaged in Fedora Linux updated to the Python 3 and um, Python 2 had some weird quirks. So Python 3 is generally better. <laughs> so it, it, it's good that we're living in the future, finally. <laughs> so yeah, I think those are a lot of those are kind of behind the scenes changes this release. Mm -hmm. There's not a huge splash um, in uh, what you'll see uh, in the desktop environment. And I think um, since we're making such big underlying changes, it's probably good to make sure we're focusing on keeping it solid this release right. and maybe we'll have some more dramatic, exciting changes on the user face <laughs> next time around. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it seemed a little bit lighter as far as features go. But like you said, a lot of it is is, is foundational. And and when you when you look at things like updating uh, DNF to, to a newer version, and in this case, a, a different language, uh, you really improve quality of life and longevity of, of a machine and e even an instance itself. So just because there's no marquee feature like completely changing the version of GNOME or, or something like that, it, it, it really does help, especially when you log in one day and you run a command and go, oh, that, that took a while. You log in the next day after an update and go, wow, that was really fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's someone out there who's going to be saying, why did why C++, such an antique language, why not Rust? <laughs> um, At and, first, I know, thought you were going to say Rust. Yeah, you know, rewriting Rust is a, Rust is a really fun language, and I understand why everyone's enthusiastic about it. Uh, but when, first of all, when this project started, Rust was very young. And even today, um, if you want to make something that's the foundation for, you know, like Red Hat Enterprise Linux and those things, like Rust as a language changes very quickly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things that are not settled. And for such a foundational thing, building it on some older technology gives us some stability. You know, um, right. 
it is a thing that seems to be get got get rewritten every I don't know five ten years. So I'm, <laughs> I would be surprised if the one next rewrite isn't in Rust. But we've got some time before that. Well, I mean, hey, in the news, uh, Linus has been uh, been working on adding some some pieces of Rust into the Linux kernel. So yeah, I, I guess we'll have to schedule an episode five years from now to talk about DNF six and how it was rewritten in Rust. Yeah. By, by I, AIs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, let's leave that one aside. But yeah, <laughs> I, I think kernel accepting it like that is a really big step towards it being widely accepted by everybody. Sure. I think that's very cool. So all joking aside, what... Let me just ask the basic question. I'll I'll let you kind of decide where to go with this because this is such an obscenely broad question. But okay. what is the Fedora strategy? Yeah. Um, so it is a collection of these things we brought together from the community. It is to double the number. The the, the um, it's to grow the community and make the community continue to be healthy and vibrant. That's the goal and our measure for it. They. they uh, guiding star is you know we watch the number of weekly contribute activity go up i think that's something we can see and measure um there are a bunch of different parts of that and we've tried presenting them in different ways that make them see seem more or less organized um the things we're focusing on right now uh, the mentorship project and uh some collaboration tools i mentioned all of our entry points being all scattered so we've had a thing we've had a need for a while to replace pagger.io as our git forge and we are looking right now of moving either to gitlab ce or forgeo for that for mm -hmm. both um the dist git the where we put the underlying you know, the rpm packaging stuff and for our other usage and right now people have a lot of people have voted kind of with their feet. And so we see people on GitLab, on GitHub, all these other places scattered around, as well as on Pegger. And that makes it really hard to know where to go to find something or to, who to talk to or where to talk about things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, on the new Git Forge, once we have it, uh, we're, I'm, I'm hoping to make it so that every team has at least a repository and a, a section there that has you know, talks about their team. And even if they want to still be using whatever other Git Forge for their day-to-day -day things, um, they'll have a land, have a landing page there that directs you to where to go. And I think that'll be that'll help somewhat. Um, we're also you know, making sure that you know, Matrix is you know, have a good moderation team, stable all the features we need there. And I am very, very slowly pushing people to move to um, to a discussion at fedoraproject.org, which is Discord, mm -hmm. not Discord, mm -hmm. but Discourse forum right. software, all open source. And um, I would really like to see uh, most of our discussion, you know, technical and otherwise, happening there. And uh, I think we've moved the change process to that, and that's been a pretty big success. Uh, some hiccups as we we're getting started, but I think it's a lot better for that than mailing lists. And mailing lists are also a place where we actually see people voting with their feet. We see a lot of cases where people are using GitForge issue trackers basically as mailing lists for you know discussing mm -hmm. discussing things. Um, and those are not you know there's it's okay to have some technical back and forth, but those really should be for work and decisions, not for having a conversation and planning it's not so great mm. at um especially when you end up I mean, relying on proprietary tools to do that that's not ideal for fedora come on um so i hope we can move that stuff back into a system made for discussion and kind of get people centralized again on one place where we're we're talking um, so that's uh, part of the strategy as well collaboration communication tools it's kind of a, actually a big bucket but it's all that same theme mm -hmm. of reducing the scatter um on the technical all right all right hint taken I, I will move the fedora podcast planning from gitlab to discourse <laughs> yeah see and there are some workflow things there as well we can we can i can help you set that up if you Ooh. want magazine you should look how fedora magazine has it set up um, okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Cool to have a parallel process to that um well, I wasn't expecting to make program changes during the recording, but hey, you uh, heard yeah, it right yeah. here, folks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, go and I'll, I'll I 
I really enjoy Discourse as software and the people who make it are great. Um, this is another advertisement that is um, not being paid <laughs> for. Um, it is very flexible and powerful, and it's um, pretty easy for me to make jokes about we could just use Discourse for the answer to any problem that comes up. Um, it's <laughs> not, not necessarily actually a hammer that will hit, you know, put in every every screw. Um, sometimes you need to use the right tool. Their tool's better for the job, but it's actually um, very flexible. And like I said, um, sometimes it's better to have things all together mm -hmm. rather than using a slightly better for one purpose tool. If you do have a Swiss army knife, you know, that people get uh, something nice about that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense because right now we're using GitLab issues and we create an issue per topic uh, but that means that our guests who may or may not be versed in GitLab have to navigate that that infrastructure in order to find the issue for a podcast episode versus using something like Discourse, where we just basically post a new topic and say, hey, episode 40, we need some ideas uh, and let people post there and tag each other. Um, so, yeah, wasn't expecting to make program changes, but I, th I think that's a change we'll, we'll implement uh, for uh, so episode 38 is already planned, scheduled, and and ready to go. So maybe for Fedora 39, I'll, for, sorry, Fedora oh, yeah. 39. We're going to get into a confusing period of numbers right there for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we're going to have uh, uh, Fedora podcast episode number 41 will release actually probably around the same time as Fedora Linux 41. Nicely timed. Nicely timed. I, I like it. I like it. I, I wish I could say that was on purpose. <laughs> So uh, so now that we've taken ourselves down this tangent about discourse and Fedora oh, yeah. podcast planning, um, kind of bring it back up to the Fedora strategy. Uh, right now, we're, we're really focused on growth and retention and mentoring. Um, is that typically the types of goals um, or are there, uh, you know, it's a three well, or four year strategy period. Are there different types yeah. of goals that uh, factor in? Uh, the the previous strategy we had was very much of around technical things and kind of reorganizing the technical parts of the project. And we have some of those things now as well. We want to move to using immutable, um, well, image mode atomic um, yes. for, for as much as possible as can go that way. Uh, I would like to say everything, but it's probably not everything by the time we're done with this. But I think that's, that will be a big deal. Uh, another thing that is really important that crosses the technical and the social is better accessibility. And that mm -hmm. is um, within you know, our own project tools and within the, the software that we ship. We want to make sure that that is uh, available for everyone to use regardless of ability and their need for accommodations. We want to make sure that we have the hooks for those things and the accommodations are there. Uh, and I know um, there are I know there are some things that are pretty rough right now, and we really want to get that that better and we have people working on that um yeah uh you know we probably also need some sort of ai thing in here uh we did a survey on ai and by ai i specifically mean large language model stuff um, which is you know we, they can do another whole tangent about what is ai and you know there is there's actually no intelligence to this it is mm -hmm. You know, very good autocomplete, but it is very good. And, <laughs> you know, I think we, we, so we did a survey and the basic answer is you know, people are very polarized on this. Uh, people have very strong opinions um, that, you know, this is burning down the earth. We should never, you know, touch it. It's a, it's a fraud. It's a, you know, the next, next, you know, um, NFT fad. Oh, um, and then other people who, you know, are really, uh, you know, seeing it be useful to them and do amazing things. Um, I'm kind of in the middle on that. I definitely see some places where it can be a really good shortcut, mm -hmm. um, and it can, can be helpful, but you have to be really careful about how you use it and what you use it for. Um, I was looking at something, I was looking at deodorant on, um, on Amazon and it now summarizes everything. Um, and it, the AI summary of it, it was a complaint that it, um, there, they were complaining. Uh, it was reversed. It was complaining that it, it, the, the deodorant. Um, did, I, I don't know. I, 
this would be a better story if I could actually remember the punchline. But it completely <laughs> the opposite and it, of what people were saying about the you know mm. it, smell or not smell. Um, so <laughs> you know, they, things get confused. I am actually really. I mean, I'm not shocked, but I'm surprised that Amazon has decided that this is going to be their production. You know, the main thing they focus on because. Mm -hmm. It is way worse than their previous thing of showing you the top popular you know, reviews in the middle range, which are right. actually generally useful. So, yeah, that's terrible. Um, and, you know, I've tried every time I see a GPT version, I try to get it to write poems of different forms. And it can't you know, just <laughs> add it math. It can't do poems. But I think there are some nice things where, you know, have augmented the models. I think the thing where you have a large language model and then it knows to access a tool that will give it answers for things mm -hmm. that actual facts. I think that's very powerful. Um, I think uh, for accessibility, um, for its text to speech and speech to text is very interesting. I mean, you, you basically for speech to text, you need to have a model. Like it can't. It it doesn't work without machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, the other way around, you know, there are obviously um, plenty of non-AI voices, and those are, I've learned, very, very, actually, um, it's what people want when they are using that to process the world. If you, it, it's amazing to uh, someone who's adept with using, you know, spoken language to get around a computer interface, like, they have it cranked up to, like, 10 times speed. It seems like an auctioneer going by even faster. It's amazing. <laughs> um, because, you know, otherwise it would be tedious. But, and for that, having a non, you, can, you can't afford the lag between an, for an AI version of it. And you also right. want it to not vary, you want it to be robotic. But mm -hmm. then in other cases where you're you know, perhaps reading something of entertainment or there's a chat going on or something, uh, it's nicer for it to actually be able to pronounce words correctly because mm -hmm. the language models are much better at those kind of things. Um, so. I think there's a use for some of that. I think we, um, I think it's important that we figure out ways to do that. Uh, we want to make sure that we are being respectful of privacy, respectful of open source norms, and we want to mm -hmm. make sure that we are, you know, um, something that doesn't take too many resources. I think there's got to be a breakthrough on this because, like, the human brain is vastly like people underestimate how much tinier in in just scope even like chat gpt4 or 4 5 all these things they're so much smaller than even of like a mouse brain right and let right. alone a human brain um but a human brain runs on like 70 watts of power at the most right that's <laughs> like yeah um so we're clearly doing something very inefficiently and i would not be surprised if there is you know, and I, I will not put a date on this because uh, it'll be wrong. But there's going to be a breakthrough at some point where someone figures out how to do the same thing, orders of magnitude, orders of magnitude to orders of magnitude more efficiently. And uh, that will be when we get a real breakthrough on all this stuff. Um, yeah. But but it's interesting and, now. And for so. those for those that don't want to hear about AI, there yeah. there are chapter markers, but. Uh, yeah. you you've you've kind of flipped that switch and and i i find i find a lot of the gpt models to be incredibly useful um just the other day i was trying to write a very formal uh, statement of, about uh, about a release or something that i wanted to make sure was was clean it was crisp and i for the life of me took three sentences to explain a thought and it just it didn't come out the way I wanted it to. So I actually just took the text and fired up one of those models, said, here's the context, here's what I've got, rewrite this to to sound more formal, businessy. And what I got back made a lot of sense. Uh, but but do I think but do I think that that's that AI is going to eat the world the way open source has? Do I think that it's going to be ubiquitous? I I don't think so, but I definitely see tons of value in the space. Yeah, um, I think I've, I've heard from people who, you know, it, it's hard to get started on writing and it can be mm. easy for anything to have, to, even if it's a terrible, something that's there that you can like fix. And um, right. uh, so people like it for that kind of thing. I I do think that, um, you know, I 
do hope the energy consumption doesn't cause it to burn down the world, but <laughs> optimistic that that will be solved. And if that does, if that is solved, um, I do think we will see um, AI like re- replacing a lot of programming and it mm. doesn't necessarily, it, it can't really replace the creativity and like the architecture and the ideas. But mm-hmm. right now we've got a weird thing where we go from, you know, a uh, human code meant for humans to, you know, uh, machine code. Let's, you know, we compile things. Mm-hmm. Um, and what AI, the large, because it's based on the language models, it uses the human side. It write, you know, will write you a Python program very willingly. Famously, you know, chatbots that are not supposed to write you Python programs can be <laughs> easily tricked and write you Python programs. Um, and, I, that's interesting, but I think it's kind of a gimmick. Um, and I think in the future, there will be um, models that basically just take your description of what you want to happen with a computer and make it happen in machine code. They make the machine code to do it, which there's we're, we're way far off from that being possible to what we have right now. Sure. But it seems like, you know, science, science fiction-y, but um, the near future science fiction, I think, mm-hmm. is that that and um the funny thing to me as a a, you know people often today treat computers like that if you're not a programmer if you're not a sysadmin you you know it's doing mysterious things that you don't know and you you whack at it and tell it other things until it behaves and i think that's (laughs) but um that tv caricature of programming and hacking and all the things is going to be reality and then Mm. people watching those old shows will be like, yeah, that makes total sense. That's how it is. <laughs> right. Right. Um, that, so there, there, how, there's, yeah. our, there's our obligatory AI tangent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so kind of close off this, this thread on, uh, on the Fedora strategy. Right now we're planned through 2028, if I have that correct. Yeah, uh, that's the end of 2028. I'm giving myself that amount of that amount of time on this and then it's you know time to look at what you know hopefully we'll have succeeded in in growing our community and make keeping you know our health um in a way that's sustainable um i don't think we would necessarily want to grow forever i think the next goal should not be to double again because (laughs) um you know you've seen the chessboard grain 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 of rice thing that's that's not a good way but i think then we'll want to kind of look and see you know what what does the computing world look like? What does the open source world look like? What do the people in our community want to do next? Where do we want to go? How will we get to you know, our vision, which is a world where uh, everyone has access to open source software that's built by a community and shared for everyone? That's um, a paraphrase, but that's you know that's the, that basic vision is not going to change, and so mm-hmm. we'll look at like what. What else? What else do we need to do now? What are our steps now to help that happen? Oh, one of the cool things I want to talk about that's um, coming out soon. It's, it should be in. Um, I don't want to steal the thunder from our marketing team, but uh, there's a thing called Fedora Ready, which is a mm. uh, a sticker program basically for hardware vendors. One of the things we identified as part of the strategy is that you know installing getting somebody to decide to install Linux of some sort on a device is very hard getting you know, change operating systems. And if also if something ships with a different Linux version, like you know, Raspbian on the Pi, like, you know, people are probably going to just use that unless they're super Fedora enthusiasts. And I would like to have more super Fedora enthusiasts. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, right. People, people do it, but it's a really <laughs> definitely big battle. So we want to be shipping on you know, more laptops on um, more, you know, small devices, I don't know, servers, who knows. Well, but shipping on on more hardware, uh, you know, especially if Risk V devices come on mm. into the market, mm-hmm. I think that it's going to be really be important for Fedora, uh, Fedora Linux to be there. And so this is a program where we uh, it's not it's not a certification or anything formal like that or or, or a partnership. Um, we're not signing deals, but there's some basic things like if your hardware you know works with Fedora Linux, you can put this Fedora Ready logo on, you know, on your site, on stickers or whatever you mm. want uh, to help you know, show that this is um, ready to go. And that help also when people want to have double sticky tape failing on me. Um, 
when people want to, you're like, okay, well, what system should I get? We'll have a page where you can look. Mm. This is the hardware. Pick one of these and you'll have the best experience. Nice. Yeah. So if, if you're watching this, stay tuned for uh, on places like Fedora Magazine and, and through our usual announcement channels, because those uh, those announcements are coming out. Uh, this may be one of the first chances for the Fedora community to hear about it. So uh, definitely excited about the Fedora Ready uh, program initiative. Yeah. Thing. Program. Pro thing. <laughs> program. I think it's a program. <laughs> So I've got to ask, what are you most excited about in the next three years? Between now and 2028, what are you most excited about? I actually, I think the um, image mode bootsy thing, next generation of Atomic, I think it's really cool. Um, I think it it's neat because it brings cloud technologies uh, in a useful way to the operating system level, um, which, you know, if you're an old old school Linux admin, you might be like, why do I want that? But it also, um, I hear you, I'm, I'm one of those, but uh, there's a whole bunch of automation and CI that's meant to, built around these cloud container workflows that we can just suddenly take advantage of. And there are a lot of people who are you know, in that world and you know, people who are coming into things that with you know, that is the, you know, mindset and that's the work that they're doing and that's a really big opportunity to bring more people into the project with different perspectives and mm -hmm. different skills that we need to be going forward um yeah I, I think that's pretty pretty good i'm also excited about getting a new git forge i have a soft spot in my heart for pegger i always will um but you know it just hasn't kept up been able we haven't had there's not resources to keep up on feature mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of things that having a modern Git Forge will bring us that will be nice. Um, and I'm also excited to see more people who grew up with Fedora Linux come into the project because that's. Mm. Well, in, in case you're curious about the Bootsy image mode uh, stuff that Matthew was just talking about, check out Fedora Linux 36, the previous episode of this podcast, uh, because we had an interview it's about Podcast Bootsy. 36, not Fedora Linux 36. So confusing. Yes, Fedora Podcast 36, not Fedora Linux 36, uh, because this came out with Fedora 40, Fedora Linux 40. Goodness confusing myself as I'm trying to explain this, but check out the previous episode of this podcast. Uh, in fact, maybe I'll put a, a link in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, we, we had an interview about Bootsy, uh, as well as a link to, uh, to a hands-on demo and plenty of information about That's it. Cool. It's really, really cool. It's basically taking cloud native methodologies and applying it towards systems administration and, and image building. Uh, as someone who's getting a little bit more gray in his beard, uh, I'm, I'm very much of the mindset that Yes, it was fun back in the day to manage all of my servers by hand and feel like I was the hero. But nowadays I have kids and D&D &D campaigns and occasionally sleep, maybe some work in there somewhere. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to have to do all that by hand. So if I can if I can build an image and even use like Podman desktop right here on my laptop. Awesome. Just awesome. Yeah. It is an amazing technology right. and I'm excited to watch it develop. Yeah. And so. Uh, I, this thing I've been playing with it, which is I have an inordinate number of computers, as you might expect. <laughs> not, not, not like some people. I don't. I'm not the rat. The like the small board computer people that have like 500 of them. Yeah, not not in that range. But you know, a half dozen computers. You know, full fledged. You know, laptops and things in the house. And I, I kind of want them to have a standard configuration there. And it was mm -hmm. really easy to do. I don't have them all on on this yet, but this is the plan. Um, have a a container that just says from silver blue and then have my few changes there and then mm -hmm. have that go through an automated pipeline come out in quay.io and then point all of my systems at that so whenever the yes. uh, whenever the silver blue up image updates my little thing spins and then gives me my updates on top of it as well and it's inconsistent across my um my different systems without me having to you know install some sort of like fleet management software yes. or that kind of thing. I just using stuff that's out there that makes it happen. That's kind of cool. I don't know if that's going to be useful widely, <laughs> but you know, if you've got a home lab or the kind of things, that's, I think that's neat. Well, and as, as a, as a former systems administrator and I, and I work very, very much in the marketing space and having a home lab is, is actually somewhat important to my job. 
but I also look at my kids and my wife, you know, my kids are, are getting closer to middle school and, uh, and as they do, I imagine they'll, they'll be interested in having a laptop and, um, I, I want to keep them off that windows thing. Uh, and yeah, I can't afford yeah. to buy everyone MacBooks. So, you know, something, something like Lenovo, um, I mean, the X1 Carbon is not the most beautiful laptop to look at, but it is one of the most solid, easy to use devices I've ever owned. And so I'm thinking like the, buying the, X1 Carbons by the pallet. More, and... more advertising we're giving away to people <laughs> on here. Right. Uh, you know, a couple of, a couple of, a uh, couple of paid for advertisements here and we could Wimbley, really. <laughs> um, others like it's, yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, what if I go and buy a pile of X1 Carbons? or slim books and give those to my wife and kids so that they have a usable laptop. I could actually build a golden image and just deploy that out. And yeah, then one exactly. of my kids deletes RM dash RF slash push the image exactly. back out, yeah. apply some configuration on top and, and you're you good to go. Give your kids the power to do that. I think, I think that's, oh, an, for sure. for that's sure. an important part of learning. You've got to learn. Yes. You can RMRF the system and put it back again. It's fine. Do whatever you want. You can't. <laughs> right. we'll, we'll I'll, I'll make sure that my image build process and my backups are solid first. Right. And then here's right. root access. Have fun. Exactly. So we're coming to the, to the top of the hour and I want to give you a chance to um, actually two questions. First off, uh, we're talking about growing the community. So the obvious question is, how can the community get involved uh, at the strategy level or with, with some of these initiatives? Yeah, so um, for most of these things, the best place to go is to discourse, um, discussion.fedoraproject.org. Uh, there's a social channel called the water, you know, a category called the water cooler. Post an introduction there and start um, you know, see where you can fit in. Um, if you prefer real-time chat kind of things, we have the same things in Matrix, the Fedora um, social space, Fedora, um, a lot of different rooms there. Um, there's a, also a welcomes introductions channel there and um, you know, show up there and uh, ask people to point you to things uh, and there will be people, people waiting to do it. Um, you know, depending on the time of day and time zones and all that. Oh, for sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think those are the probably the best places to um, plug in and get help. Awesome. Yeah, and there'll be links to our matrix space and to the discourse in the show notes. Uh, so, with that said, Matthew, any any closing thoughts? I I'm excited for the future of Fedora for open source. It continues to be interesting times, even after you know twenty years of Fedora, ten years of being Fedora mm -hmm. project. Um, there's still excitement in it. So I, uh, I'm glad that's true, even if sometimes it's a challenge. <laughs> well, that's awesome to hear. It's, it's always a good sign when, when those that are, are, are paid to, to watch over something are, are still excited about it. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's definitely a joy. And, uh, uh, so definitely stay tuned to the Fedora discussion page. We'll be doing some podcast planning there. We've got episodes between now. Can't believe we're already talking about year end, but we've got some plans between now and the end of the year to talk about Apple. Uh, probably have an episode around Fedora Linux 41, Fedora Linux 41. Um, if you can you make know, that podcast episode 41, that's perfect. So hey, I think if, if we, well, hold on. I got the calendar right here. Uh, so end of October is what we're looking at. Uh, so episode 41, if we hit every two weeks, episode 41 would be released on November 19th. So I okay. might have to hold our Fedora Linux 41 episode until November 19th. So Make even if engineering forward. slips a week or two, yeah, yeah. we could still... Well, I'm not going to delay the release for the podcast. <laughs> I'm just gonna... Well, I mean that that hurts, Matthew, but yeah. but I, I understand. <laughs> so, for those of you that uh, that are out there looking to see what's coming, uh, Fedora Linux 41 is out there uh, uh, is is on the horizon. Been seeing that question. Uh, CentOS Stream 10 is imminent. Uh, I think the ISOs are there. They just haven't uh, released the or announced the release yet. Uh, rel 10 beta is just a couple of months away. Um, and, uh, and, and I heard from flock that there's some big changes, uh, with the KDE spin, the KDE desktop, we might have to have somebody from KDE oh, yeah. come and talk Definitely. about, uh, 
come and talk about that. So there's tons of stuff going on. And hopefully if I move some of the planning into, into a visible space like, like Discourse, maybe we can get uh, guests lined up a little bit easier. Uh, I'd also like to announce that we're, I'm, I'm bringing on uh, hopefully a more permanent co-host. Uh, we've kind of had round robin of guests and co-hosts, but uh, a lot of you know him. His name is Noah Chalaya. He's the host of the Ask Noah Show. And I don't know if maybe he's cloned himself or if maybe he exists only as an AI now, but uh, he, he had, uh, he uh, shared an interest in, in joining the Fedora podcast alongside me. So uh, I, I believe next episode in two weeks, uh, Noah will actually be joining me as a co-host. Uh, next episode, we'll be talking about Fedora QA. So that's quality assurance. Basically, people write code, push code. How does it, how do we know it's, how do we know it works? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what else does this it's, break? It's important. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Um so if you're interested in if you're interested in testing and coding, uh, maybe a little. I'm, I'm hoping to talk a little bit about the Fedora Beta program as well. Um, so definitely catch us in the next episode as we talk about Fedora QA. Uh, Matthew, anywhere else we should be sending folks? Send them to Fedora, I guess. That's the... <laughs> if you're listening to the Fedora podcast and not using Fedora, we need to talk. So. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, Matthew, thank you so much. I know you're incredibly busy and, and recovering from Flock and, and the uh, the fall series of, of in-person events. So I really appreciate you taking some time uh, to sit down and chat with me. Uh, I'd like to bring in the FPL a couple of times a year to talk about Fedora and what's coming. So definitely appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. It's always fun. We always have a good time. And in, in fact, we should probably record the, 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 pre, the pre-show just because... There's no telling what you and I talk about beforehand. True. <laughs> uh, so Matthew Miller is my guest today, the Fedora project lead. We talked about the Fedora strategy and coming up is Fedora QA. So thank you all for joining us. And on behalf of the entire Fedora project, thank you for joining us.